Welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Thank you for tuning in, and welcome to This Just In. I'm your host, Justin Barnes. In these segments, I'll bring you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. As always, we're broadcasting from the This Just In studios on the Business Radio X network, as well as the Healthcare Now radio network. For this episode, my 267th episode, we have a great guest from Chillmark Research, Elena Yakovlea. Welcome to the show, Elena. Thank you. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for having me here. You got it. So um, you're dialing in uh, a little remotely, and we'll probably get to that here in a moment. But where'd you grow up, attend school, college, all that good stuff? <laughs> well, uh, I'm quite an international person. I grew up in St. Petersburg in Russia, and I graduated from St. Petersburg State University, majoring in sociology. And then I got my master's in Germany in Free University of Berlin that was in international affairs. Excellent. Very cool. Um, what, uh, what kind of drove you into that path of life and studies? Uh, well, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, I'm always a curiosity-driven person. Mm -hmm. So whatever I find interesting, that's pretty much <laughs> a green flag for me. That's where I'm going to go. Okay. And uh, in sociology, I just realized that the whole structure of society uh, is a foundation for all the changes. So in other words, if yeah. you really want to understand all the dynamics that are happening on the surface, uh, you really need to look into some foundational things and uh, look back how it all, yeah, you know, how it was all evolving and developing. And I think in general, um, sociology is a great place to start. It was not specialized too much and it gave me, you know, a very broad spectrum of things uh, to choose from. Uh, and I was specialized in intellectual capital um, mm. on my faculty, and I just found it very interesting. And then I, I just naturally <laughs> uh, followed my childhood dream, and I just wanted to go into international affairs to find out a little more. It was at the time of the Crimea crisis, and um, I just wanted to understand more about all those unfortunate circumstances and uh, territorial, territorial developments. Uh, so I just decided to go to school and deep a little um, and go a little deeper uh, with, uh, again, the, you know, the theoretical component of international relations and case studies so I could develop my own perspective. That's fantastic. And Yakovleva is a Russian name or what is the background? There? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually the literal translation to English is Jacobs because uh, Jacob in Russian is going to be Yakov yeah. and the ending Leva, it means um, pretty much the daughter of. So uh, Yakovleva is the daughter of of Jacob. So that's an exact translation. This last name actually of a Jewish origin, even though it sounds Russian. Um, again, it's due to a very complicated history of my country and a sure. crazy mosaic cultural exchanges that that have been happening over many, many centuries. Yes. Love it. Love it. So tell us about your path that brought you to Chillmark. Well, um, I was looking for a very new type of job <laughs> that I've never done before. I've been in revenue cycle on provider side for good 12 years, 11 before I joined Chillmark. And I just started to feel like uh, I wanted to make a bigger impact. I was facing same issues over and over again from one vendor to another, from one payer to another. Mm -hmm. And finally, I realized that I was not in a good place to fight all those issues. And I started to look for a pretty much like a deep research position. And I was 
looking for this like perfect position for probably a year. I was interviewing uh, companies. I was looking for that one perfect spot. Uh, and I found Chillmark. And obviously after uh, my first interview with John um, third, I felt like that's the right people. That's the, the right uh, mission statement. And then I had an interview, the final one, with um, John Moore the second, who is the founder of Chillmark Research. And unfortunately, he passed away yesterday. Um, and I just fell in love immediately mm -hmm. with uh, his experience, with his perspective, with ultimate um, independence on research and no place for speculations or you know any kind of um like bias sure in the research that mark is doing so i just realized that was the place i was looking for for so long and obviously i'm still with them and hopefully i'll be there for many many years to come yeah chill mark has such a great reputation in the industry i think uh you're founded in oh oh seven is it it was yeah i think about 15 yeah. 16 yeah um but a uh, yeah, phenomenal organization. I've had John Moore the third on several times my radio show and several members from um, the Chillmark team. So yeah, just a great organization. And um, you know, it's uh, I'm I'm glad you're here today. What, what we're talking about, hospital at home. Very excited about this uh, about the research and and you know this uh, burgeoning field. But um, also, what brought? I mean, before we dive in there, what brought you into digital health? This is always a great story about how people find them, themselves or make their way into digital health or health IT. So I always love this question. You know uh, what I find? I always being asked this question from these grounds, like, "Oh my God, <laughs> healthcare is so complex and just so 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 bad. How do you work in healthcare?" So that's what I'm usually being asked. And for me, it's such a natural choice. I'm from a medical family. I've been working in, um, like, you know, in the healthcare system for so long. And I feel like I was even born, you know, in health system because when my mom, my mom is a physician, she worked in emergency medicine. And whenever she couldn't find anybody to leave me with, I would always go to her work. Like I was four and five and seven and nine. And I would just, you know, spend time at the hospital or like emergency, like medical stations. And I enjoyed it greatly. And I saw all this hard work. And, you know, quite frankly, it was, uh, I mean, I'm 34. And that was uh, back in the, like, you know, 90s, like middle 90s in Russia. And I just saw how hard they worked. I just saw how uh, those people were trying to truly help their patients with um, very limited resources, trying to do their best. And I I was always asking those questions like, why can't you make something better? Mm -hmm. Like make that EKG smaller right. <laughs> or have like, you know, 15 thermometers instead of one or like to, you know, to have more medications to help your patients easier and better and quicker. And that was pretty much a rhetorical question back then. But now we do have plenty of answers and <laughs> that's actually why I love it so much. Absolutely. And, you know, that's that's a huge privilege of uh, living in 21st century for sure, even though like we'll have some <laughs> romantic aspirations from like 19th century or 18. But realistically, I'm just looking around and I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's a blessing that you can actually be in this place where you can do stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as a leading industry analyst, you know, what trends most excite you now in healthcare innovation? Um, you know, probably the most exciting for me personally, even though it's not the biggest trend, but um, I'm really excited to see uh, what's going on when, with RCM. I'm talking mm -hmm. prior authorizations. I am talking about very convenient ways uh, for patients to pay their bills. I am talking for all these price transparency initiatives uh, when patients can actually see upfront 
right? All the costs of the care and some of the shoppable instruments that we have now in healthcare. Yeah, I would I, not be super hopeful, but we we, we have some versus like 10 years ago, it was almost sure. none. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, we're, you, uh, you're, I'm going to have you back on air because those topics specifically are very near and dear to my heart. Um, so mm -hmm. good, you know, good faith estimates now across the industry. Certainly I, I work in the lab space. So, um, you know, seeing that, uh, to come to fruition, obviously the patient pay and prior authorizations, those are right up my alley as well. So let's, we'll do a side segment <laughs> on those topics here, you know, maybe in then <laughs> cut to a couple months. So that's great. I love awesome. it. Awesome. So yeah. today though, I mean, diving in a little bit to the hospital at home, you know, your trends report that just came out. You know, tell us a bit about that. Tell us what you, you know, your findings and your research. And it's, uh, it's, I had a glimpse of it. It's, I love it. It's excellent. So I have some follow up questions, but, you know, tell us a little bit about your uh, research there. Oh, oh my God. I can talk about it for hours and hours. So please stop me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for asking this question. And also, I just, want to thank all the people who were talking to me over the course of my research. Um, always happy to talk. And we have amazing community, as you probably, mm -hmm. like, for sure, oh. you know. That, oh, yes. And that one of the benefits of being in digital health. Uh, so hospital at home, again, so it just interlinks with my life so much because my mom was working in a hospital at home care de delivery model, 30 years ago, and I saw it in action back then. Um, very poorly executed, but the idea was almost the same. So when um, I was given this topic, I just, you know, I was like overexcited. And actually the research took a lot of time. And I think we all right now just see it happening. Finally, after all those years of discussions and talks and uh, we probably all know all those stories from John Hopkins and how it all began like a century ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we were waiting on execution and actual deliverables. And right now, it actually happening. So that's the most exciting part. You, as a, as a patient, you can just go to the hospital that have this model mm -hmm. and be home and have medical care instead of being in the hospital. And I think that's the main achievement of hospital at home right now, that it actually, it made it to the ultimate receiver, to the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, few interesting facts is um, I realized how different and diverse <laughs> our country is. So we all think, uh, talking about technology, we usually think that New York is the entire country. <laughs> and then you go deeper and you realize like, no, 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 no. Country is so much bigger and the problems are so much different from those um, in big cities where we have uh, like a lot of technologies and a lot of possibilities in terms of like connectivity and some others. And what I see is that a lot of companies, they are still trying to solve connectivity issues with remote patient monitoring, remote physiological monitoring devices, and even telemedicine, uh, and all the digital component that's going to be connecting patients to the provider centers or hospitals. That part still need to uh, grow a bit to actually say, yes, as a country, we have hospital at home care model. Mm -hmm. so, so that's probably, yeah, go ahead. No, thank you. I mean, I guess, so, you know, do you think this model will be the norm in the near future? I think so, yes. So um, I do see that a lot of providers are still hesitant yeah. And I do see a lot of pilots and when I'm precise, I precisely look into the pilot size, it's one patient. So we see a lot of providers doing it, but when you look closer, like they have five patients enrolled, like or one patient enrolled. Mm -hmm. I think that's because uh, the market is still very, very immature. The market of solutions, um, the market of devices um, in general. And I think a lot of provider organizations, they just don't want to spend yet. 
but I'm sure it's going to grow. I mean, my forecast like for uh, until 2028 shows that it's going to grow like three times. Yeah, I think it has to be. I, I completely agree with you. I, I believe there's it's got also not only the technology and, and, and affordability, but also the use case. I mean, I think there's, you know, you gotta find the right use case um to make sure that that type of, you know, disease state or or whatever, you know, um issue is happening can be treated in a remote facility. And obviously there's there's lots that can be, and I, I totally support this model. I think it's it's very, very smart. But back to what you said, the technology innovation needs to be there. The care models have to be there. The integration has to be there from a data perspective. It can't just be in isolation. So um, there's, there's a lot of pieces, but I think we're moving, you know, from what I've learned, even my friend, John Holomka has done a lot of work on this. Um, and uh, we've even talked a bit about on the radio show as well, but I, I do believe this is a, you know, this is the future. Like you said, it's it's absolutely the direction we're going as a country, even, you know, globally. Um, and we're beginning to, uh, to perfect it in a lot of ways. So I, um, I agree with you. It's happening. What are you know? What are the, some of the challenges that we're going to face? I mean, we talked we already talked about a couple of them, but you know, what are your thoughts on challenges for the hospital at home? Um, I think uh, there are a few big ones that I see. Uh, first challenge is actually staffing, and I do think that we need to dig more into uh, what's going on with clinicians in the United States. Mm. And I hear a lot about burnout, but I am confident that. The way burnout's being described and being interpreted, it's a it's just it's a wrong approach in a medical space specifically. I, I'm sure it's quite different from other cases, and I think we need to treat it as a separate issue and address it in a very uh, unique way. So I think that's one. Uh, second piece is um, just overall economy state that you know, bothers a lot of people and a lot of buyers of the solutions. And I just think that we need to get through it. So maybe like in two years from now, it's going to be a lot of fresh air and it's going to be much, much quicker in terms of like how many of IT solutions providers going to buy, what can they afford mm -hmm. and so on. And also I am waiting for the reimbursement policies for hospital at home Uh to get more stable, more clear, uh, so just providers can count on them and have a much more stable models when they start implementing hospital at home. Uh, another issue, most likely for many, many, many providers is that they need to keep a steady number of patients enrolled. Mm -hmm. So when we launch hospital, uh, hospital at home program, we usually, we invest a lot, we train stuff. Usually there's going to be like additional hires specifically for this program. So we need to make sure that we have a stable number of patients and how to ensure you have that stable number of patients. You need to expand the range of diagnosis you can treat at hospital at home. And that becomes one of the major issues for a lot of companies who are doing hospital at home themselves. So when they choose to actually use their own solutions, homegrown solutions, or just um, assemble, you know, their like technical foundation for hospital at home using a number of vendors. So for them, one of the main issues is actually to... Um, to make sure that they can successfully and safely treat those patients with many conditions and the comfort of their homes to make a stable number of patients enrolled and to make this program sustainable. So uh, among those providers I'm talking to uh, who just starting, I think that's the main barrier for them. And after they overcome this barrier, it pretty much, it goes like a snowball. You know, the more patients you can treat, the more stable the program is going to be, the more you invest back into this program to expand it even more. That's actually a great analogy. Um, and uh, and I actually, it's uh, that's very encouraging. For those that may join us a little late today, my special guest is Elena Yakoleva from Chilmark Research. So 
going back to your research, we've got about five, six minutes or so in the show. Any left for this episode? Do you, ha- what, like, what are one or two things that we could call out that my audience would be, oh, wow, that's, that's encouraging or that's really interesting? What do you think would be one or two pieces from your research that's kind of groundbreaking, earth shattering, or most interesting? You know, I will go with something that was actually on the surface, but still a lot of people just don't see it. Uh, you mentioned John Halamka, uh, who I respect a lot for all this for all his hard work. And uh, in one of the interviews, he was saying that Mayo Clinic is going to be getting a ma- major part of their revenue from yes. digital health, right? Yes. I think it's one of the major twists uh, in thinking in modern healthcare. When a lot of people, they're just holding back, they're saying like, oh, yeah, yeah, wait, let, let's wait for five years. Let's wait wait for 10. And then they're losing momentum. And we see what we see happening with hospitals in the past five years. I, I think that um, the time got so much quicker so it's very condensed time that we're living in right now. And I think the ability to notice trends, to actually be able to believe that you can do it with limited resources right now is most important to be on top of your game. And uh, investments in digital health, for sure. I mean, it, it just, that, that's the new reality. That's the way that all the hospitals should be taking. And it's going to be fruiting pretty soon. So like maybe those investments are going to be big, but the return on them is going to be really great. Uh, (laughs) And second is, I just think um, talking about hospital at home, I had no idea how popular it was. Actually, so many entities doing it from payers to employers, to providers, they're just not saying it. They're not calling it hospital at home. Mm. But when you dig deeper, you just start seeing it. Okay, so they've been doing it for like 15 years. Those guys have been doing it for like for 10. And they've been pretty successful. They're just not talking about it. They're not saying, um, you know, like, oh my God, finally, we are the first implementers or anything. They're just, you know, keep on doing it quietly. And uh, they're getting all the benefits from hospital at home that are pretty much proven. Um, so I think that that is very interesting. Yeah, no, I, that's fantastic. And yeah, John's a great guest, a, a friend of mine, but also, and I love John, he's actually the most frequent guest. So the fact that you uh, also brought him up in May on what they're doing is, uh, is phenomenal. Um, I have one last question, probably time for one last question. What are some of the things that you do to work um, your best and make a difference? You know, I I always put myself in the shoes of the patient, always. Uh, Just because I think that thinking uh, uh, thinking about patient first will make us all win. And I talk to patients a lot. I am... Sometimes I'm a patient myself. I drive an Ubers. I always talk to drivers. And the question they all love is like, oh, my God, how are you feeling today? And then the story begins. So (laughs) I try to talk to as many people as I possibly can about their healthcare experience in the United States. And some stories, they actually come from abroad. They come from India. They come from Europe. And I'm just trying to compare experiences even though systems are very different. But I think that we cannot deny that world is getting global. So I'm just trying to think what it's going to be in 12 years, in 20 years, in 30 years from now. And I'm trying to to think how we can all contribute to ultimate well-being of all the patients in the future. Yeah, fantastic. That's a great answer. I got one final question that I try to ask all of my guests. Um <laughs> Where do you invest your time, talent, and treasure, and why? I always invest everything I can in relations with people. I think that's uh, that that is the most valuable thing in life. 
um, I was 15 and I really wanted to have my car and then I bought it. <laughs> then I really wanted to have a fancy purse when I was like 16 and I bought it, but it never gives you fulfillment and joy, um, uh, progress and very genuine feeling of inclusion. And I think that actually that should be your ground and that's what you should be investing in. I think uh, Frankel, Victor Frankel said that you have to invest in those things that you have after everything, <laughs> like after your whole house got burned, right? So you're going to have actually actually people who managed to escape yourself, your experience and your relations with those people. So I truly believe in that. I love it. Elena, you're a great guest. Thank you so much. I'll certainly have you back on air. I'd love to talk about RCM and, and that whole revenue cycle strategy and the other components you brought up soon. But thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful, Justin. Thank you so much for having me here today. You got it. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And please tune in weekdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. As always, you can track me on Twitter at HIT Advisor and use the hashtag ThisJustinRadio so we can respond to your comments from the show. If you missed any of this episode or want to hear more, all my shows are posted at iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and tune in. And also you can check out some of the new content we just posted at justinbarnes.com. Thanks, everyone, and stay safe. Hey.